Ladies and gentlemen, this essay is a complimentary presentation to my last video, a presentation on the appeal of 300, and discussing how it contrasts with current Western culture. I would strongly recommend watching that video before continuing. Some time ago, there was a rather large debate online about the nature of the damsel in distress trope. The interlocutors were progressives, feminists, and people who can best be described as anti-SJWs. The discussion centred around whether the trope was a good or bad thing. To generalise largely, progressive feminists thought it was a bad thing, and the anti-SJWs agreed with them, sort of. It must be understood, the feminists' main objection to the damsel in distress trope was that it portrayed women as inferior to men in these properties. Strength and the ability to defend oneself. The progressive position in recent years has been one where sex differences are denied, except for perhaps the plumbing, and it is asserted men and women are both equal, and the same in all ways. Now, at the time this argument was taking place, most of the anti-SJWs agreed with the assertion that men and women are equal and the same. Thus, their arguments in defence of the trope were rather weak. At this point, it must be stated that the anti-SJWs were not so much trying to defend the generic convention as much as they were the games they enjoyed playing, which of course contained the trope. For the most part, the anti-SJWs try to argue that the portrayal of damsels in distress did not make any negative statements as to the strength of women, and neither did it reinforce those evil patriarchal gender roles which built Western civilization. As a result, their arguments were doomed to be unpersuasive because they were, unwittingly perhaps, arguing within a feminist egalitarian frame, where they agreed that any portrayal of a woman as physically less capable than a man was wrong. Since such games surely did portray the opposite idea most of the time, the anti-SJW's attempts to explain these portrayals away were oftentimes unimpressive. The thing is, both sides were trying to be feminists in one way or the other, and as it turns out, feminists are better at being feminists than anti-SJW's. Go figure. Now, I was watching this debate as it happened, and although I rarely agree with the progressives on anything, and I felt they were wrong in their attacks on the trope, I never found the opposition's case convincing. It seemed empty, and in hindsight, I cannot say their arguments were ever strong. So for this essay, I'm going to mount what I believe is a better defence and analysis of the damsel in distress convention, and its story type. Without more to do, let's begin. When considering a story, genre, or trope, a good place to begin before analysis is to ask the question, whom is it for? The common narrative perpetuated about stories with a damsel in distress is that they are aimed exclusively at men, that they are designed to appeal to a man's fantasies and to promote ideas of the low worth of women. Now, I do agree that the damsel in distress trope is a fantasy for men, but I believe it is also a fantasy for women. I will explain what I mean by this, and then provide some examples which helped me come to this view later in the video. Now already I can hear the obvious question, but your imperial majesty! Why would any woman fantasise about being locked in a high tower or being captured by an evil villain? Nobody, male or female, would enjoy such a thing. I completely agree. However, I'm not going to argue that the whole thing is an appealing fantasy for women. It is possible for only a small part of a fantasy to be appealing to its audience. For instance, a man may like fantasising about being a noble warrior who goes around killing the forces of evil or fighting bad men. When such a fantasy is put into a film, the appealing part would be the actual proficiency in violence and the action scenes. What would not be appealing in the fantasy is the actual training and exercise a man would have to undertake to be so good at fighting evil. When it comes to the damsel in distress trope, the kidnapping and the months of imprisonment are not the appealing part of the fantasy. The appealing part is the rescue by the man, who, as we shall see later, is not just a normal guy half the time. But why would this be appealing to women? The reason the damsel in distress story is appealing to men is because the male rescuer is an exemplar of protective masculinity. I go into this idea a lot more in my video, A Presentation on the Appeal of 300. I shall link that video in the description. But moving back to women, what could be appealing about the damsel in distress story? To reach an answer on this point, 
We need to examine the sexual dimorphism in the human species, and recognise how it changes the way men and women act in the world. Here is a very brief overview of some of the differences between men and women. Men have 43% muscle and 15% body fat on average, while women have 36% muscle and 26% body fat. The differences may not sound that great, however, what this means in the real world is that a woman has about 40-70% to of a man's upper body strength. Men are much stronger. This is due in part to the amount of testosterone men produce. This hormone causes muscle growth. Men have higher testosterone levels than women meaning greater muscle mass and stronger bones. Women are on average physically weaker, and even when both the average man and woman follow the same workout routine, the man is always stronger at the end of it. These physical differences do translate into the real world. I'm going to link three videos in the description. The first is a boxing match between a female soldier and a male marine in the US military. The second is a Muay Thai match between a male Muay Thai fighter from New Zealand, a practical nobody, and a female kickboxer who was one of the reigning champions in the female kickboxing and boxing world. The third is the most tragic and arguably the most humorous. It is a video of three policewomen trying to arrest a man in Sweden. I hope after watching these we can agree that men are the better fighters. I don't know how many women need to be knocked out in the ring by men before this is accepted, and I don't know how many men with gender dysphoria need to beat female competitors in women's competitions before this really sinks in. Please consider this Muay Thai fight again. The man knew how to fight, but he wasn't the best of his sex in this field. The woman, on the other hand, was one of the best of her sex in this field. This man did not become a male Muay Thai or kickboxing champion, but he was facing one of the greatest kickboxing female champions in the world. The question has to be, what would this fight look like if the reigning male kickboxing champion of that day had been in the ring instead? Now, this doesn't mean that there won't be a woman sometime in the future who can beat the best male fighters. If you will, a female Mike Tyson who can take the male Mike Tysons of this world. However, it is highly, highly improbable that such a woman will be born. Nevertheless, even if such an exceptional woman steps into the ring, she will be the example of an exception, not the example of a rule. Also, on a related but tangential note, this is why this is a feminist delusion. The women in this photograph may well think that this demonstration is emblematic of a dawning new age where women are the wiser sex and are the subjugators and men are the subjugated. But the truth is, women do not force men to bow before them. Men choose to bow to women. If all these men decided to stand up and walk away, these women wouldn't be able to prevent them. Or, if these men decided to physically assault these women, the women would have to be rescued by policemen. And no, I'm not suggesting that the men in these photographs should have physically attacked the women in front of them. My advice to these men would have been, do not go and take part in this. Women have always been aware of the fact that men are better fighters and acutely aware of the danger bad men pose to them. This would have been especially true in the past. Many millennia ago, the world was a far more hostile place. Some places are still rather dangerous, but much of the world is civilised to varying degrees. When people live in a hostile environment, both men and women are more aware of their weaknesses, because not only can they be punished by the elements and the wildlife, but also potentially by other groups and tribes. In such a time or place, both sexes will take steps to better ensure their security. A man in a hostile environment will group together with men of a similar mind, acquire weapons, and train with them to help and ensure his safety. This is an option for a man, because he can likely reach the same level of physical strength and skill as the men of a rival hostile tribe. With very few exceptions, so few that they aren't worth talking about, women cannot do this. A woman will not become as strong or as tough as the men who might kill her family, and forcibly take her as a wife or sex slave. She cannot magically increase her testosterone levels to make her bones stronger, her muscles bigger, and her body taller, so that they match that of a man's. In a fight, she will always be at a disadvantage. Thus, the woman's strategy to ensure her security cannot be and wasn't the same as the man's. This is less true today, but back then, the woman's strategy was to marry the most powerful man she could, a man who had a wide circle of tough male companions, a man who could both protect and provide for her and any potential children. Hearing this, is it any surprise that women always yearn for the same type of man? Everyone knows the type. Romance novels are full of these men. Tall, dark, dangerous, handsome, strong, and rich. The reason is, these idealised men 
are good both at protecting and providing, and thus would make excellent husbands. And so is it any wonder that shorter men often complain of women overlooking them because of their height? Well, of course not. All other things being equal, shorter men are just not as dangerous as tall men because of weight differences. Shorter men tend to be much lighter than taller men, and so, in a fight, the taller man has the advantage. There are weight divisions in martial arts for a reason. Now, let us return to the damsel in distress story, and its appeal to women. It is appealing because the rescuers in such stories are always, or nearly always, ideal men. They have all the qualities a woman could want in a husband, courage, strength, and skill at arms. These, of course, are not the only things women look for in husbands, but these things do rank quite highly. Often in the damsel in distress stories, the male rescuer is not only strong, brave, and skilled in battle, but also of noble character, and usually rich and of high status. This is why princes are the common rescuers in such tales. They have it all. There is also another reason I think that the damsel in distress convention is appealing to women, and that has to do with the desire to be valued. Everyone, men, women, and penguins, want to believe they are valuable, that they are important. The woman in a damsel in distress story is nearly always important. She is often a princess, but even if she isn't a princess, she is always important to at least one person in the story. If you are trapped in a high tower, guarded by a dragon, you'd have to be valuable, in one way or another, for a man to risk death trying to rescue you. Women like to vicariously live through the distressed damsel and imagine that they themselves are as valuable and as sought after as the heroine in the story, if only for a moment. The same way men like to think or imagine they are something like the great warriors portrayed in action films, if only for a moment. As a side note, I think this desire to be sought after and fought over finds its representation in romance fiction as the dreaded love triangle. Wherever a love triangle is found in a romance novel, there is often a fight or argument of some sort between the two male love interests in front of the heroine. Before we continue further, it should go without saying, but you can badly execute the damsel in distress convention or put it in a film or story in which it doesn't belong. Similarly, you can badly direct an action film or scene, or put action in a film where it doesn't belong, and when you badly execute a trope or put it in a story where it doesn't make sense, people will react negatively towards it. So my argument and reasoning may sound convincing, but why not look at some examples? We could look at the romantic novel genre, which is well known for containing many novels which have men rescuing women. For instance, the first and very successful Twilight novel, where Edward saves Bella not once, not twice, but thrice. First from a skidding van, second from a group of guys with ill intent, although he didn't fight them, he just took Bella away from them, and third from another vampire. At this juncture, let's run a thought experiment. Let's imagine an action novel has been written, wherein the main hero is beaten by the love interest in a fight. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Does this sound like a novel which would garner a large male readership, spawn a saga, and sell millions of copies? Of course not. Men wouldn't enjoy it for the very reason that the hero, with whom they are supposed to identify, is beaten by a woman several times. If men did read and appreciate such a novel en masse, we would assume they either liked the fact a woman beat the main character, or that they didn't care about it either way. So if the damsel in distress convention does not appeal to women, or worse even, turns them off, then someone needs to explain how Twilight and its subsequent saga managed to gain such success while still employing these tropes in the beginning. Or how about the equally, if not more successful, Fifty Shades of Grey, which was originally a fan fiction of Twilight. Fifty Shades of Grey contains a scene where Christian saves Anastasia from being kissed by a nice guy who turns out not to be nice. I have noticed that the fake nice guy is a stock character in romance literature, which is interesting in and of itself. Looking at romance literature would be fun for this video, but I think there is a set of better known examples we should consider. All of these films, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, Aladdin, The Little Mermaid, Tangled, and Hercules. In these films, there is a scene wherein the hero rescues the heroine from either the villain or some other danger. Now, these films are not strictly aimed at women, but instead have been produced to appeal to families. However, one will easily note how popular these films are with girls and women. They are massively popular with women in a way they just aren't with men. 
It may seem easy to brush off the suggestion that one of the main appeals of these films to girls and women are the moments where the hero rescues the heroine. After all, there are plenty of other factors which can explain the appeal of these stories to girls and women. But I want you to imagine something. Imagine that the damsels were never in a state of peril where they needed to be rescued by the heroes in these films. What would these films look like? Well, they certainly would be less interesting, and this is an automatic result whenever you take conflict out of the story. It always becomes less interesting. Adding more conflict always makes the story more interesting, although there is a balance which needs to be struck for the story to be good. For some of the films mentioned, the removal of these scenes or moments would destroy the plot, but most importantly, I think it would ruin the film's appeal to women and girls. In each of these films, the rescue scene is where a positive virtue or aspect of the hero is revealed to the audience. In Snow White, we know that the prince is Snow White's true love because it is his kiss which awakens her from the magical slumber. In Sleeping Beauty, Prince Philip's battle against the witch turned dragon proves he is a brave warrior of considerable skill. In Beauty and the Beast, we see that the beast is not completely selfish, and is willing to put his life at risk for people he cares about, including Belle. In Cinderella, while the prince does not directly rescue her, his commands to find her do. The lengths the good prince is willing to go to to find the mysterious woman he met at the ball shows the audience that he really is attracted to Cinderella. This means quite a lot when you consider that he is the crown prince and could have his pick of any of the women in his kingdom. In Aladdin, the audience is introduced to Aladdin's intelligence by watching him trick Jafar into wishing to become a genie. He does this after bravely fighting Jafar with the sword. We also see how his first concern is Jasmine, because the first thing he does after tricking Jafar is rush to save her. In The Little Mermaid, Eric shows his courage and mastery of sailing when he kills Ursula the Sea Witch and rescues Ariel. In Tangled, Eugene's actions are that of a selfless man. He cuts Rapunzel's hair to free her from the villainous at the cost of his own life. Moreover, earlier in the film, Eugene manages to defeat several armed soldiers in combat with a frying pan. That is impressive. Finally, in Hercules, our hero, who has defeated many monsters in battle, risks his life to save the woman he loves. He risks his life in a way he hasn't previously in the story. This is a trial slash task where his super strength barely counts for anything. These rescue sequences show the audience, and especially the women within the audience, just how much of a catch these heroes are, and demonstrate that they would make good husbands. The men in these stories prove their worth in these scenes, and show that they are worthy of the women they love. As well, they reaffirm that the women in the stories are worth fighting for and are valuable. Remove these scenes, and the audience would be left wondering as to the quality of these heroes and whether they really cared for the heroines. We also would be wondering whether the heroes were such a catch after all. To help prove my point, let's take a look at one of the more recent Disney films. Frozen. Only one of the heroines, Anna, finds love in the story. By the film's end, Anna gets together with Kristoff. Now unlike the previous films and novels I've listed, Kristoff doesn't at any stage rescue Anna from danger or anyone else for that matter. He does play a useful part in trying to get Elsa to return to the kingdom because he has a sledge, and agrees to help Anna. Otherwise, he barely does anything worth noting in the film. Because of all this, he isn't an impressive love interest, unlike, for instance, Eric in The Little Mermaid, or Philip in Sleeping Beauty. Now, Kristoff is an alright guy. Although not rich, he is tall, he isn't disagreeable, and he seems to be a hard worker but he never proves that he is a capable protector, and so he never demonstrates that he is worthy of Anna, who is a princess. In short, he never gives the audience any reason to think he is a catch or good potential as a husband. Now ladies, I have a question. Who would you rather marry? One of the heroes I mentioned in the last list of previous films, or Kristoff? Gentlemen, who would you rather be compared to? One of the heroes I've listed previously, or Kristoff. And fathers, who would you rather your daughter date, and maybe eventually marry? One of the men mentioned previously, or Kristoff? I rest my case. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, despite the claims of progressives, feminists, and other egalitarians, the damsel in distress convention, and the associated story type, are not evil, and are not constructions of insidious patriarchs for the purposes of unfairly dominating women. Instead, the damsel in distress convention is a fantasy which appeals to both men and women 
and is a reflection on the truths and facts of human biology. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all have an excellent day. After finishing this essay, there is an obvious question remaining. If the damsel in distress convention is enjoyed by both men and women, what are we to make of the increase in action heroines who are also enjoyed by men and women? I will probably make a video on this sometime in the future, but for now, you can politely discuss the matter in the comments. Emphasis on politely.